You're looking at the Kabuchi Desert, 18,600 square kilometers of sand, closer to Beijing than Los Angeles is to San Francisco. For decades, this desert was killing China's capital. Sandstorms shut down airports. The desert expanded 40 kilometers east, swallowing villages. Then, in 1988, one government clerk made a decision that seemed impossible. He was going to stop the desert. 30 years later, one-third is green. So how do you make 6,000 square kilometers of hostile sand bloom without massive technology, without unlimited government funding? The Kabuchi Desert is China's seventh largest desert, covering 18,600 square kilometers in Inner Mongolia, roughly the size of New Jersey. But geography made it critical. Only 800 kilometers from Beijing, when sand moved in Kabuchi, Beijing felt it within 24 hours. Kabuchi wasn't always desert. This was once farmland with rivers and grasslands. Then desertification accelerated. Sand dunes reached 60 meters high. Winters hit minus 20. Summers above 40 degrees Celsius. By the 1980s, 70,000 villagers faced extreme poverty. The sandstorms kept hitting Beijing. Villages were being abandoned one by one. Families who had lived there for generations packed what they could carry and left everything else to be buried. The few who stayed lived in extreme isolation. The nearest city was hours away on roads that disappeared under sand weekly. Children grew up never seeing green. An entire generation knew only sand, wind, and poverty. Beijing residents could taste the sand in their food during storm season. Cars were sandblasted, buildings coated in grit. Wang Weibiao wasn't an environmental scientist. In 1988, he was a government clerk who took over the near-bankrupt Hongjin Key Salt Works on the desert's edge. Wang had grown up in Inner Mongolia. He understood what the desert meant. It wasn't just environmental, it was personal. His own family had felt the poverty. The salt works was losing money every year. Sand buried roads, equipment, buildings. Insurance companies wouldn't cover operations in the desert. Wong realized something. To do any business in the desert, he first had to deal with the sand itself. Most advisors told Wong to liquidate and move the business elsewhere. He refused. His early pitch to investors was simple. We either make the desert work for us, or we lose everything anyway. In 1999, the government built a 115-kilometer highway through the middle of Kabuchi. Within months, sand swallowed it. That's when Wang's company, renamed Elyon Resources Group, committed fully to desert restoration. His plan wasn't just environmental, it was economic. He needed to make the desert profitable to sustain long-term restoration. His solution had three revolutionary parts and it started with a tree that shouldn't survive in a desert. So, in 1988, Wong's team began planting drought-resistant willows across thousands of square kilometers. Wong learned from desert research stations that willow roots could reach underground water reserves. Most trees have shallow root systems, 10 to 20 meters deep. But willows are different. Their roots can reach depths of 30 meters or more, tapping underground water reserves far below where other plants can reach. These deep root networks hold sand in place like an anchor. They hired over 100 bulldozers and hundreds of workers in 18-hour shifts to flatten sand dunes and build windbreak fences stretching for miles. The breakthrough came with a high wind pressure water jet planting technique, reducing planting time from 10 minutes to 10 seconds per seedling. Workers would blast a hole one to two meters deep into the sand with high pressure water, insert the seedling, and the sand would collapse around it securing the roots instantly. This wasn't random planting. The willows were arranged in grid patterns, checkerboard formations that scientists had calculated would maximize wind reduction while minimizing water competition between trees. In peat planting season, teams could plant up to 100,000 seedlings in a single day across multiple sites. Early survival rates were brutal. Only one in five seedlings made it. But as techniques improved, that jumped to four in five. Each willow also became a seed bank, their roots stabilized the soil enough that wind-blown seeds from other plants could finally take hold. 2020 figures showed these willow networks were holding back over millions of tons of sand every year, reducing wind speeds by up to 90% in protected areas. But trees alone weren't enough. The sand still lacked nutrients. That's where the rabbits came in. In 1859, a British settler introduced 24 European rabbits to Australia for hunting. Within 50 years, they exploded to hundreds of millions, eventually occupying 70% of Australia's landmass, the fastest mammal invasion ever recorded. They devastated grasslands, 
caused massive soil erosion and contributed to desertification across huge swaths of the continent. So when Wang Weibiao announced he was introducing millions of rabbits into Kabuchi, scientists thought he was repeating history's worst ecological mistake. But these weren't ordinary rabbits, and this wasn't going to be like Australia. Wang used French Rex rabbits, a breed with fur so valuable it's called the white gold of the fur industry. These rabbits survive in minus 20 degree weather, drink minimal water, and reproduce rapidly with high survival rates even in extreme heat. But here's the risk nobody talks about. If even a few dozen rabbits escape, like they did in Australia, the entire restored ecosystem could collapse in months. So how do you keep millions of rabbits contained in the middle of a desert? Here's the critical difference from Australia. These rabbits were never released into the wild. They live in controlled eco-farms where every element is managed. And here's the genius. Rabbit manure contains nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. The three nutrients desert sand completely lacks. When it drops to the ground, it turns sterile sand into fertile soil for the first time in centuries. There's a second miracle. Rex rabbits can't fully digest grass seeds. So every time they defecate, they're essentially planting seeds with natural fertilizer attached. During the next rainy season, those seeds sprout. The cycle became self-sustaining. Young willow shoots feed the rabbits. Rabbits produce nutrient-rich manure around the willows. The manure fertilizes the soil. The soil feeds more trees. The economic model matters. Farmers are paid for rabbit products, meat and fur. This creates financial incentive to maintain the system properly. If rabbits escape or the system fails, farmers lose income. Self-interest aligns with ecological goals. By the 2010s, the rabbit breeding program was generating significant economic return. Local farmers who were once living on less than $1 a day were now earning stable incomes managing rabbit eco-farms. In the heart of the desert, his company built the Junma Solar Power Station, a facility spanning several square kilometers with over 700,000 solar panels. At its center sits the project's crown jewel, 196,000 panels arranged in the shape of a galloping horse, covering 1.4 square kilometers. From space, it looks like a horse running across the sand. In July 2019, Guinness World Records recognized it as the largest photovoltaic power station with image-shaped panels on Earth. This isn't just art. The 300-megawatt installation generates approximately 2 billion kilowatt hours of electricity every year, enough to power 300,000 to 400,000 people. By 2022, it had saved over 760,000 tons of coal and cut 1.85 million tons of carbon dioxide emissions. But here's what makes it revolutionary. The solar panels reduce wind speeds and create shade where grass can now grow. Rabbits, sheep, and other livestock graze below the panels, stabilizing the soil while electricity generates above. From sand to a closed-loop economy, meat, fur, manure, biogas, tourism, solar energy, and medicinal plants like licorice. By 2020, one-third of Kabuchi was green. But here's what nobody expected. The world started paying attention, not for environmental awards, but because countries were facing similar crises and had no solution. The wildlife diversity in the region has grown significantly since 1990. Species that had completely vanished were appearing again. Groundwater conditions improved noticeably over the following decades. The vegetation coverage rate reached 53%. Over 100 native plant species returned, from feather grass and desert poplars to wildflowers no botanist had seen in the region for 40 years. The air quality improved measurably. Particulate matter in nearby cities dropped significantly during what used to be sandstorm season. Rainfall patterns began to change. Restored vegetation was creating its own microclimate. More moisture in the air meant slightly more precipitation, which fed more growth, a self-reinforcing cycle. The soil composition transformed. Core samples showed organic matter returning to the top layers, something that takes centuries naturally was happening in decades. In September 2013, Wang Biao received the United Nations Global Dryland Champions Award at the 11th Conference of Parties to the UN Convention to Combat Desertification in Winhoek, Namibia. He was the first recipient of this award. In 2017, he won the UN Environment Program's Champions of the Earth Award, the UN's highest environmental honor for lifetime achievement. As of 2019, Kabuchi officially became a UN Global Land Restoration Demonstration Center. The UN Environment Program initially estimated the project's total ecological value at approximately $1.8 billion over 50 years. 
However, more recent ecosystem service valuations using comprehensive gross ecosystem product accounting calculated the value at over 55 billion yuan, 7.6 billion USD, from 2000 to 2020 alone. The largest contributions to this economic value were sandstorm prevention and water retention. But Kabuchi's impact extends far beyond one desert. China is now exporting this model worldwide through the Green Belt and Road Initiative. Spain's drought-threatened Andalusia region is implementing the Kabuchi approach. Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Saudi Arabia, and the UAE are studying the solar agriculture integration. African nations across the Sahel are partnering with Chinese experts trained in Kabuchi. From a single desert to a global blueprint. From 1988 to today, the Kabuchi Desert went from a national crisis to an international model. From driving communities into poverty to lifting hundreds of families out of it. Wang Weibiao proved that even Earth's most hostile places can bloom again. Not in centuries, but in three decades. Not with one silver bullet, but with integrated systems. Trees that anchor sand, rabbits that create soil, and solar panels that generate power while nurturing life below. The Kabuchi story shows that geography isn't destiny. It can be rewritten with engineering, investment, political will, and most importantly, an economic model that makes restoration sustainable. What worked here is now being replicated across four continents. But here's the question. Kabuchi required over $6 billion in combined investment, mostly from private enterprise backed by government policy support over 30 years. Can other countries facing similar desertification replicate this model without China's unique combination of patient capital, government coordination, and scale? That answer will shape the future of millions living on the edge of expanding deserts worldwide. Thank you for watching it, and if you liked it, make sure to share and subscribe for more True Geo Stories. See you in the next one!